Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this special public discussion. It's uh, wonderful to, to see you all here. Uh, my name is Josh Horden, and uh, I'll be chairing the event this evening. It's a joint event between the Philosophy Society and the Christian Union. I'm a member of the, of the Philosophy Society and of the Christian Union, so it's a great pleasure to, to be with you this evening. The title for this evening is The Resurrection of Jesus, Religious Invention or Historical Fact. And we're delighted to welcome our speakers, Gary Habermas and Ken Humphreys. And I'll hand over now to Georgie Gardner, who is the president of the Philosophy Society, who will be introducing Gary Habermas. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Professor Gary Habermas gained his PhD from Michigan State University. He's now a distinguished research professor at Liberty University and is a visiting professor at 15 different graduate schools and universities. He's published 32 books, half of which are on the resurrection. Gary Habermas. And now I'll pass you back to Josh to introduce Ken. Uh, Ken, Kenneth Humphreys has taught both in the UK and abroad, including a senior lectureship in modern languages. Uh, religion, and in, particularly, uh, in particular the claims of Christianity, have been a real lifelong interest for Ken. He is now fully occupied as a writer, radio broadcaster, and public speaker, and campaigns energetically against the tide of resurgent superstition and unreason. I'll give you Kenneth Humphreys. With those introductions over, uh, I'll now explain the format for this evening. We'll start off with two statements, one from uh, Ken initially and then from Gary, of 15 minutes or 18 minutes of length, around about that sort of length. And then we'll have some responses from both sides of about five minutes or so. And then we'll have a time of open discussion between the two speakers. After that, there'll be a time of Q&A. And for that time, all you need to do is raise up your hand and I'll, I'll point to you and the roving mic will reach you. Then just say the, the question uh, nice and clearly, and then, uh, then they'll respond. After that, we'll have some closing comments from the speakers, and, and then we'll finish. So, to begin our public discussion this evening, uh, we have uh, Ken Humphreys. Good evening. Um, I'm not a great believer in conspiracy theories, but it did seem as if today somebody on high was making life difficult because there was uh, a four-hour delay uh, at Gatwick Airport uh, thanks to a, an unusual storm. If it was an attempt to prevent my speaking here tonight, it did at least fail. Okay, let me thank uh, both the uh, Christian Union and the Philosophy Society uh, of Edinburgh University for this opportunity to speak. Let me also thank uh, Gary Habermas for this uh, willingness to debate on a topic that I certainly find of, of consuming interest. So there's some joy in that, but uh, I should also say there's some sadness in the fact that here we are in the early years of the 21st century and, and yet we are discussing the uh, reality or otherwise of the resurrection uh, of a man from, from beyond the grave. Um, it it's, it's, would perhaps in all places seem unfortunate here in the city of David uh, Hume that we have to uh, discuss this issue because I think he himself, if we allow the, the possibility, would be turning in his grave that we still entertain such ideas. Um, in view of the time span, I may have to speak fast, but we, we have a lot of ground to cover. The, uh, the 19th century was notable for the progress of, of humanity in its understanding of the universe, and its successes, of course, led to the retreat of religion in many spheres, so that it was a reasonable expectation on the part of many thinkers in the early years of the 20th century that 
by now, religion would have retreated into the shadows. And it certainly seemed that way as the hammer blows of science and rationality forced religion to retreat. And uh, it no longer, with any great commitment, uh, maintained its old truths. Now, that prevailing optimism of a rational future without superstition prevailed through much of the 20th century, of course. And I can remember in my early childhood, you know, the, uh, the enthusiasm of projects like the putting of men on the moon, that the future seemed to be bright and the future seemed to be very rational. And what perhaps helped summarize and uh, capture that, that optimism for a scientific future was a program like Star Trek, which gave us on a weekly basis a vision of what life might be like in the 23rd century. It would be a rational future where mankind would boldly go across the universe and religion didn't figure in that really much at all. If you remember the early series of Star Trek, well, the only time religion intruded was when a primitive alien race was either deluded or some devious aliens were using technology to fool simple people. But humanity was guided by the logic of science. Now, that seemed to be sufficient for most of us uh, back in the, in, in the 60s and 70s. And it's rather surprising that now in the 21st century, some of the battles that had been fought in the 19th century need to be refought. Now, why is that? Well, I think partly the answer is the same wealth that brought us things like the Apollo mission and putting man on the moon also fed itself into colleges of biblical study throughout the USA who had, since the famous monkey trial of the, in Tennessee in the 1920s been somewhat cowering in a corner. Very uncertain about the future because rationality and science threatened the very existence of organized religion. Now, they may have become a footnote in history were it not for the fact that some of the delights of, of technology, such as television made it possible for religion to move to the, the forum of, of mass communication and we had the rise of TV, TV evangelicals who were very adept at selling Christ and very adept at raising vast amounts of money. Now, from that time in the 1970s, uh, these institutions have developed a response to the rational revolution. They've learned certain tricks and certain ways to gain credibility, one of which is to use some of the language of science. So they talk about data, for example, you know, in a very scientific term. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the, the wealth provided a number of scholarships, provided the development of a number of, of biblical schools, even the emergence of some strange institutions called Christian universities. Um, certainly strange to any rationalist, that is. Okay, they have come forward now with a number of explanations, if we put it that way, which challenge science, science across a broad front. We're all familiar with the, the notion of uh, now called intelligent design or creation science, which is a thrown down the gauntlet, of course, to evolutionary biology. We have the challenge of something called young earth geology. And of course, we have a whole body of information relating to the central beliefs of Christianity, which are no longer perceived as simply matters of faith, but we are told they are matters of fact and history. And the resurrection of Jesus is described now as one of the best attested facts in history, which to anyone of a rational uh, disposition seems an extraordinary claim that we might be able to maintain 
the, the, the resurrection of a person from death 2,000 years ago is better attested than, say, the Battle of Actium or, the, or, 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 or Julius Caesar. But these claims are regularly made. Now, let me familiarize you, those of you who have never entered the twilight zone of Christian apologetics, just how this methodology works. And I'll briefly give you an introduction that won't take more than about three minutes, which I think we just about have time for, but as it relates to a different resurrection, that is of someone other than Jesus. Now, the person I'm going to take for this example is actually known to you all, and you will you, you immediately recognize the example. If we take the story of Snow White, you will know that she returned from death through the kiss of a prince. Now, many of you might think that that is a fairy tale story, but actually it's one of the best attested events in history. Now, how can we prove that point? Well, we have a number of first-hand witnesses to that event. For example, we have the handsome prince himself. Now, his life was changed by that event. He got married. He lived happily ever after. So we have a witness there that we can rely upon. Who else do we have? We have the wicked queen. Now, that's a particularly good witness because she gives enemy attestation of the event. She wanted Snow White dead, but no. So we have a second really good witness. We had the witness of the, her ser the servant who was sent to kill Snow White. Now, he changed his mind, of course. He didn't kill Snow White in the forest. He let her live. So here we have a very good witness from a cynic, a sceptic. We could say that he changed his mind, he's a, sec a third good witness. Now, we, we have something which we might also describe as an embarrassing witness. For example, we had the witness of the magic mirror. The magic mirror is such an obvious silliness that the fact that it's in the story proves that it must be true. Okay, and giving some support to that idea is an early creed. That creed, as we all know, is mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of us all. Now that shows that that story is actually more, can be traced back to prior evidence. The creed obviously preceded the story. So we have the evidence there of a creed. Who else do we have to, to bear out this, 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 uh, this story as, 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 as history? Well, of course, we had the statements made by happy, grumpy, sleepy, sneezy, dopey, bashful, and doc. We had seven first-hand witnesses to the resurrection. In total, then, we have 11 witnesses, first-hand statements that this is actually history. Do we believe it? Of course we don't. It's a fairy story. I'm just playing with words. And Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs is a fairy story. And I'm sorry to tell some of you that Jesus Christ and the Twelve Disciples is a fairy story. And evidence for the resurrection is constructed in precisely the way I've outlined. Now, we might maintain, of course, it could all be true anyway, in which case it requires a miracle. Now, I'm not going to rule out a miracle, a priori. After all, by its very definition, it's something so unusual, we wouldn't, know it, we wouldn't have evidence for it. At least, how would we prove that it had ever occurred? Okay, so my point would be that we have no evidence for the resurrection other than that which has been carefully constructed by people so motivated to maintain the truths of a, of a, a religion which had been weakened to the point of almost self-destruction by the proofs of science. But nonetheless, you know, we, the, the, the industry which can present this, this, uh, this, this story as fact has vast strength, vast resources, 
transmits its message across the world, holds forums explaining how it is all true, and I have to say, it is all bogus. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. I too had problems getting here, so I think we're even. <laughs> we left, well, I won't go into detail, but we were in the storm. And then I get up here and I try to take some notes, and my pen quit writing. That's a serious matter. So, you know, whose side are the forces of nature on? I don't know. I would like to also begin by thanking the Christian Union and the Philosophical Society of Edinburgh University, and both Josh and Georgie. I appreciate this opportunity. Beautiful venue. Nice to be with you. Flew into town today. Have to leave tomorrow. But I'm very happy to be with you this evening. I'm defending the view that you just heard was a fairy tale. But that's okay. Ken's a good guy. We've talked on the phone. We had a little time before. I told him, I said, if we were neighbors, we would probably get together during a football game, and we have a lot of chats. I think we should. I think this thing is wonderful, uh, a discussion like this. Let me first begin by telling you some things I am not going to try to do. Or, so you're clear about my position, things I am not defending. Okay? First of all, I do not argue that Christianity is vindicated by faith, and we should all believe. I am interested in data, historical data to be exact, other kinds. Secondly, I will not argue tonight, the Bible tells me so. My beliefs about the Bible aside, I will not assume inspiration of the Bible, biblical reliability, or anything of the sort. I'm going to make an argument for the resurrection that borrows sources and data from critics, agnostics, atheists, who are writing today the biggest name scholars writing today of those mindsets, I'm going to use their data. At no point will I assume, I mean, I mean, of course I'm willing to talk about the Bible, and I assume Ken will too, but I think what I'm saying is, I'm referring to the Bible as an ancient document. The way you might ask a question about Shakespeare or Homer or somebody else, Suetonius, Tacitus, what do we know about data? Thirdly, I do not believe that things are true because scholars say so. I don't, I, I should say it this way. I don't think things are true just because scholars say so. But I think it's very, very important that we understand the scholarly lay of the land for this reason. Not because scholarship proves anything, but because if scholars from the left, right, and center agree on something, they probably agree for good reasons. There's, there are probably reasons behind their agreement. But I don't think citing scholars solves the issue. I'm not going to argue tonight, it might surprise some of you, I'm not going to argue tonight that the resurrection is a miracle. I'm going to argue that the resurrection is an event that occurred in history. A man named Jesus of Nazareth died, and a man named Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was later seen. And that would constitute resurrection, to appear after a real death. So that's my argument, because I'm giving deference to David Hume here, we're in his city, and uh, he says a miracle is an act of God that breaks the laws of nature, and that's just part of the discussion I'm not going to be able to get into. Those are some thoughts up front. What I do want to say is, let me go back to this earlier topic, I want to argue that we have data for the resurrection, and I'm going to give an argument here in just a moment for the resurrection, and I'm going to limit my facts almost totally to folks with whom I have huge disagreements. Um, I'm going to limit my survey to, as I said, atheist, agnostic, and skeptical New Testament scholars or theologians. Because once again, I'll repeat the principle. I'll go in reverse order. There's two principles here. The second one is, I build a lot on where scholarship is. Not because that in itself proves anything, but because I think scholarship is there for a reason. And when believers and unbelievers agree about something, it's usually because there are reasons. It's usually because there are data. Okay, so if you ask a Christian, if you said, 
um, here's the New Testament. And you want to talk about this man, Jesus. And the Christian says, yes. And he said, but the man's in the book. Yep. I don't believe the book, so I don't believe the man. Uh, that's a thoughtful objection. And I'm going to take about that same approach tonight because, I'm, as I said, I'm not going to assume either inspiration or reliability. But if you ask the average Christian that question, they're going to say something like this. Well, if we want to talk about the resurrection of Jesus, we need to take a look at the Gospels of Mark, uh, in normal order, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. And these, articles, these Gospels are usually strewn along a timeline from about 65 to 95 AD. For example, the well-known uh, skeptical scholar uh, G.A. Wells, who um, from uh, London area, argues that all of these Gospels are written before 120 AD. Okay, that's a typical approach, but to, I think the best approach to argue for the resurrection is to use the writings of the Apostle Paul for this reason. Today, Paul is the critic's darling, you might say. Critics from the opposite side of the spectrum that I'm on will say Paul is the critic's darling. Why? Well, Michael Martin, atheistic professor of philosophy in the U.S., wrote a book called The Case Against Christianity. He says this, Paul's testimony is the only eyewitness testimony we have for a resurrection appearance of Jesus. Okay, so I can either say, well, wait a minute, how about the Gospels? Or I can say, I'll take Paul and move with him. And just to start, I'm going to take Paul. Now, probably the best-known critic in our country, the best-known skeptic in our country, is an agnostic scholar, and his name is Bart Ehrman. He's written a number of books. Generally, he's published by Oxford University Press, so there's a little tie across the ocean. And Bart talks about the undisputed epistles of Paul, as almost every New Testament scholar does. And they will generally label seven books with that title. Bart would say, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, Philemon. And I'll, and I'll just note in passing, G.A. Wells gives the exact same list with Colossians added. So G.A. Wells has eight epistles. These are dated between 50, sometimes scholars go back as early as 48, but these are dated from 50 to 60 A.D. G.A. Wells dates them from 50 to 60 A.D. So I'm using G.A. Wells, and I'm using Bart Ehrman, an agnostic. So I'll say, okay, well, let's take a look at Paul's epistles. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 3, excuse me, Paul says this. He says in verse 3, I gave you what I was given. And he's using technical words for passing on tradition. Now, if we believe Tom, uh, Tom, uh, excuse me, uh, Paul's own testimony that he was a Pharisee, we know from Josephus and others that these same terms are used by Pharisees for the passing on of tradition. This is a, a society where it's very possible that 90% of Jesus' audience was illiterate. And for that kind of an audience, you have to uh, tell stories, perhaps. We call those parables. Or you have to make statements, shorter, pithier statements. And I think that was the creedal portion of the Snow White story, because critics make a, make a big deal of short passages in the New Testament that basically answer the question of what did earliest Christian preaching consist before the very first New Testament book was written? And creeds are the answer to that question. They fill in the gap between 30-ish, the approximate death of Jesus, 30-ish and 50-ish A.D. And Paul's reporting one of these. If contemporary critical theology agrees on one thing today, it's that 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in that text, beginning with verse 3, Paul is reporting material. Let me step out here and do it this way. If this is 55 A.D., the writing of his book, and back to that table is the death of Jesus. Let's just say it that way. Paul says, 55 AD, the dates are the same, whether you're looking at critics or believers or whatever. And Paul says, verse 3, I gave you what I was given. Now let me first give you a critic's conclusion. This was not developed by believers or conservatives. It came from the critical side of town. I'm not pointing at Ken, by the way. I'm talking about my timeline here. Um, and here's the, here's the conclusion 
that they come up with. I'd be glad during the Q&A or any other time to give you bibliography, names, dates, uh, doctoral theses, whatever you want. But the leading conclusion is that Paul received this material in 35 AD. And here's how they get this. The cross, about 30. Paul's conversion is placed at about plus 2. Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, an undoubted Pauline epistle. In fact, Bart Ehrman calls these six epistles that I've already outlined for you. He calls them undisputed Pauline epistles. There may be a person here, and there are a few people, but for the most part, for an agnostic New Testament specialist like Bart Ehrman to refer to the undisputed Pauline epistles, he must not see too many people on the horizon who are going to disagree with this picture. And the idea is, here's about 30 AD. Paul meets the risen Jesus, he claims, about plus two after this event. He says, three years later, Galatians chapter 1, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem, two plus three, five. So we're at about 35 AD. And Paul said, when I went to Jerusalem, he said, I didn't just go up there. Well, C.H. Dodd of Cambridge makes a famous statement. He said, Paul didn't go to Cambridge. <laughs> Paul didn't go to Cambridge at all. Uh, he said, Paul didn't go to Jerusalem to talk about the weather. What did he do? He said, I interviewed Peter, the apostle of Jesus, and James, the brother of the Lord. And he said, they're the only two apostles I saw, and I talked to them for 15 days. In context, Paul is witnessing regarding, in the context, they're talking about the nature of the gospel. And then right afterwards, Paul says, I assure you, I didn't lie about this. I talked to these fellows, and we confirmed the gospel. This is just plus five. Now, critics argue that Paul received this creedal passage. Recently, Richard Baucom, just recently retired from St. Andrews. He's living in, in um, Cambridge today. And Richard Baucom has just argued that what I'm giving to you is not some conservative, if you believe, inspiration kind of. He argues this is the consensus of modern scholarship. The consensus puts Paul's receiving this material in 35 AD. But the two men from whom Paul probably believed this material and received this material, Peter and James. Now, now let me just stop there for a second. I'm not talking about Paul's own appearance. I'm talking about the two disciples talking about their appearances, Peter James, the brother of the Lord. And he hears this here at about plus five. But these two men had the material, obviously. They had it before Paul had it. So we have to be earlier than 35. Now, creedal material is formulated. It reads in the Greek. It reads a da 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 style. Now, it doesn't rhyme like English poetry. But there's a staccato sense to it. It breaks the syntax of the sentence. Anyway, scholars have pretty well agreed where these things are. And, and again, there's scholars over on the other side of the equation. So, now let me, let me stretch out this five years. This is 35, that's 30. Paul receives this material. It's a consensus of scholarship, according to St. Andrews, Richard Baucom. Paul receives this material plus 35. The two men from whom he received it, Peter and James, the brother of Jesus, had to have it before him. If you're going to give it to somebody, you have it first. Now, this is the date of the formulation of the creed. The events on which the creed are based has to be earlier still. And if you have two steps in between 30 AD and 35 AD, we're getting back very, very close to the events in question. How close? Am I just talking about conservative Christians? I am not. For example, let me cite one of the men on Ken's website, Gerrit Ludemann, atheist New Testament scholar in Germany. Gerrit Ludemann says, he, he admits this whole timeline, and he says, as well as the general dates for the epistles of Paul, the, uh, what's called the authentic, the undisputed epistles, and Ludemann says, the latest that this material became a creed, the latest is 33 AD, or plus three. He said, that's the latest. In our country, you have a group of folks called the Jesus Seminar. They're extremely skeptical. In the press, they're almost synonymous with skepticism. They're the ones who throw beads in the hat, and they've rejected 80 to 90 percent, depending on how you count, they reject 80 to 90 percent of the so-called red-letter sayings of Jesus. The Jesus Seminar, not conservative, founded by Irish scholar John Dominic Cross and American scholar Marcus Borg, who's an Oxford grad, by the way, 
but they founded the Jesus Seminar, and they say the latest this material could be is plus two years after the death of Jesus. Plus two years. The latest contributors to this discussion are three British scholars, one right here in this city. Well, he's an American, but he's the head of a British department here, Larry Hurtado, and he said recently he has studied the subject of the deity of Christ. It's been his specialty for 35 years, and he said there's never a time when the earliest Christian preaching, there was never a time when Jesus was not preached as A, divine, and B, raised from the dead. In other words, Hurtado says the message goes back to 30 A.D. Second case, the one I mentioned, Richard Bauckham, St. Andrews. He says exactly the same. Never was a time when Jesus was preached as anything other than deity or raised. Now I'm going to tell you why this is important in a moment. Third voice is as influential a scholar as there is today in historical Jesus studies, James or Jimmy D.G. Dunn, University of Durham. And Dunn, in a recent book on Jesus Remembered, Dunn says this material becomes formal, formally creedalized material no later than 30 A.D. Now, folks, these are scholars from some of your own universities here. In fact, I could mention Tom Wright in here, too, professor both Oxford and Cambridge. Folks, this is not an example of what kind of silly Christians are still believing this since David Hume. This is not an example of, I think it's kind of a red herring to say, what about TV preachers and Snow White? How do these people get away with teaching this kind of poppycock at Edinburgh, Durham, Oxford, Cambridge, wouldn't they be drummed out of court if this was on the level of Snow White? You'd think so. But these fellows have written extremely influential books. Now I'm going to have to stop in a moment, but here's where I'm going. If Jesus dies here, and there never was a time when he was preached as anything other than deity, dead, and buried, what Christianity calls the gospel. If there never was a time, what that means is we don't wait decades and have somebody say, oh look, Virgo, that must be the virgin birth, which was recently proclaimed, or go a few more decades and say, hey, I think this guy must be God. I don't want to be second best to the other religions around here, Isis and Osiris and others. Let's say he's God. Yeah, I'll say he's God. If you say he's God, yeah, from now on he's God. Oh, hey, what happens to gods? They're raised from the dead. So another hundred years later, we say he's raised from the dead. That's not the way it went. When you're doing historiography, the key to historiography, there's a bunch of rules. And actually, Ken did a good job mentioning some of the rules. Embarrassing testimony. This is just the way the New Testament scholars do it. It's the way historians write the past. I'll give you examples if you want. But the two most important things in historiography are the two E's, early and eyewitness. Early and eyewitness data. And what do you have if the story goes back here and you have three folks talking just five years later? By the way, just a few years after that, Galatians 2, Paul goes back to Jerusalem. He said, I laid before them the gospel I was preaching, of which he says the resurrection is an indispensable point, a part. Peter's there, James, the brother of Jesus, is there, and now it's John's there. This is the big four. They're the most influential believers in the early church. Paul said, I set my gospel before them, and they added nothing to me. You know what that shows? It means Paul didn't make it up. It means it didn't come decades later because they're all agreeing. That's what that means. So on historical principles alone, that on the left wants to say, hey, these are the rules of engagement. They've set the rules on this because they came up with this. What we have is a report that is early. How in the ancient world, where the first biography of Alexander is plus 400 years after Alexander the Great, we have a report from 30 AD. And we have four major eyewitnesses. Folks, I'm just saying, this is only beginning tonight, but I think we're well on the basis of saying this is more than Snow White or Christian happenstance. OK. Thank you, Gary. Um, the, the Gary has tipped the bucket open now. And we can look at uh, some substantial points here. Um, 
I agree we should look at Paul. I mean, he's a main man here. In fact, we should look at both Pauls. Because if you read the epistles, you'll actually identify a totally different man from the one you read in the book of Acts. Now that should make you wonder for a start. Why is the man who is, writes these epistles, why is, is he this bombastic bully, whereas the man you find ri written up in the book of Acts is this team player who's on side with the other disciples. He's taken, he's delivered, he's brought here, he's brought there. That is not the Paul that lays down the law in his epistles. So that at least should make you wonder. Okay, um, he mentions this early creed, which I referred to in the Snow White story. Yeah, yeah, I agree, it's a creed. And the way you can identify it's a creed, if you take the verses before and after, you realise they run on to each other. The creed is there, and it wasn't part of the original. Now let me give you an alternative to this idea, as Gary goes with his his timeline back to the beginning you know there is an alternative that that creed was not there at the beginning it was inserted afterwards and he mentions uh, Gert Ludemann as agreeing with it well I'll give him a scholar Robert Price does not okay we can all quote scholars Robert Price says that's an interpolation inserted in the second century and that's more likely and I'll tell you why that's more likely Compare the, the possibilities. Would people who witness an extraordinary event called the resurrection rush off and write down a creed? Would they really do that? First he was seen of Cephas, and then he was seen of the disciples, etc. Et Would they really do that? Where do we get creeds from? You think of the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, various other creeds of the church. Where do they originate? Do they start with those? No, they are the resolution of church conflict. They come out of the struggle of different contended factions of Christianity to agree what they were going to believe. And after the fight, which was acrimonious, often violent, if you consider the, the, uh, the origin of the Nicene Creed, it came after the battle with the Arians, and Arius was murdered. You know, and then you have the creed. You don't have it to begin with, so at least consider the alternative to this earliness of the creed. It's a later interpolation. Compare that creed to what is said in, in, the, in the actual Gospels. First he was seen of Cephas. What was he? What does the book of John say? I thought that was Mary Magdalene. You know, if you compare the creed to the Gospel story, it doesn't link at all. Let's take one other very crucial line that perhaps Gary can illuminate. Paul, in his creed, says... Jesus was seen above 500 of the brethren. Where does it come from? Certainly not found in the Gospels. Isn't it curious that Matthew, Mark, Luke and John don't refer to 500 witnesses of the resurrection? I wonder if Gary can provide an explanation for that, because I can. It's found in the Buddhist texts. There's an explanation for you. Gary, I think we'll be hard-pressed to find an explanation for it. Um, let's take another matter relating to Paul. Notice how it slipped into the dialogue, the authentic epistles of Paul. Now, I would suggest that if you actually start any study of the epistles, the epistles you will realise that from the word go, many of them are fake. The debate among scholars is just how many of them are fake. Everyone seems to agree that Hebrews was not really written by Paul, but were any of the others? Were the prison epistles? You know, were the pastoral epistles? Weren't they written by the church to try and establish the, the power of the bishops later in the second century? The whole genre of Pauline literature was fabricated, and okay, it is more difficult with some core epistles to identify quite when they originated and quite by whom they were written, but clearly there are several writers involved in the so-called Pauline epistles. So there's many gaps in, 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 uh, <laughs> in, in, in Gary's story there. Um, he uses, as, as, as I've noticed, the word data. Data, really, relating to supposed events. I would say if you try and build up a timeline... Which part of the story do you begin with assuming is correct? 
because you can build a timeline so long as you assume, for example, I'm sure Gary will assume, well, Jesus was crucified and there was an empty tomb, let's assume that bit, then let's try and work out the rest. But why should we make that assumption? Should we not actually find evidence of everything? You know, if we are to believe that this is truth and not a fairy tale, should it not all be substantiated? So I put it to you, there are so many areas of concern and doubt in the story, this cleverly wrapping it up with so multiple witnesses is all a fraud. It's all a fraud. And we can go on to look at these many witnesses, which I'm sure Gary will want to cite, and actually look what they say. And when you look at what they say, it really doesn't substantiate the claims made for them. So I repeat, we are dealing with a fairy story. I commend you on getting what I count seven arguments in in five minutes. That's brilliant, and I mean that. Let me try to respond to all seven. First question, which Paul do we believe? The Paul of the Acts or the Paul of the Epistles? It's very easy in terms of my debate tonight. I've already said I'll be glad to go back and talk about the Gospels, and I'll put Acts in that group. But I'm starting with Paul's authentic epistles tonight. More about that in a moment. So it's very easy. If somebody was to, were to say to me, Acts contradicts Paul, I say, hey, I disagree. And I'll be glad to talk to you about that tonight. But that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm going to stay with Paul. So if you say you must choose, must choose, I'll take Paul. It's that easy. A later book can't militate against the early one. And by the way, who concludes that? John Dominic Crossan. He said, when Acts goes against Paul, I'll take Paul every time. I didn't think I agreed with Dom on too much, but I agree. The Creed. Bob Price is a very good friend of mine, and he and I have dialogued. You can find this on our website. Bob, okay, we're not going to settle with head count. Bob is about, there might be three other scholars in the world. I, my bibliography in the resurrection is over 3,000 sources. Bob is about the only person who believes this portion is interpolated. Richard Carrier, from the same Internet Infidels group in America, Richard thinks Bob is incorrect. Now, I think, I mean, that can happen. But if we find a person and say, well, well Bob disagrees with you, okay. Without exaggerating, in fact, I have a book right here where you can check the endnote out. I have 30 scholars in here, all of them skeptics, all of them critics, all of them agnostics, and they agree with this timeline. Now, Look, I'm not saying it's 30 to 1, therefore I'm right. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if it's, remember my lead comment, if it's 30 to 1, it's probably because the reasons are better on that side. Okay? Thirdly, oh, and he also made the comment about Arians, the Arian Creed. I, I might have misunderstood him, but it sounded like he said it wasn't even around then. Folks, let me tell you something. All 58 verses of 1 Corinthians are in the earliest papyri. They might even be dated from 150. But by 200, anyway, all 58 verses are there. So it's nothing that took, you know, like Arians would be 4th century. It's there. Mary Magdalene or Peter? Sure. Paul starts out with Peter. And so does Luke, by the way, as far as the men are concerned. Now, I admit, the women, appearances to the women predate the men. We can discuss this. But in the early church, sorry ladies, they generally did not let women testify in a court of law. They did, but not usually. Now, I think that's wrong, and we probably all think it's wrong. But that, according to most scholars, is why Paul did not start. It's not Paul anyway. It's a pre-Pauline creed. But that's why they did not start with the women. Because if you're going to put your best foot forward, you know, put Peter out there. And the very first appointment, appearance to the men, we're told by both Paul and Luke, is to Peter. 500 witnesses at one time. Thank you. 500 witnesses at one time. This is like the Acts objection. He says, well, tell me where this thing fits in the Gospels. On the methodology I'm doing tonight, it's irrelevant. Now, I'll tell you where Gospel scholars put it. I'll, I'll just go ahead and put that in there, but this isn't the point I'm trying to make. Gospel scholars will often try to say the most likely place for the appearance of the 500 in the Gospel narrative is the appearance in the mountain in Galilee. If 5,000 could be out there for the feeding of the 5,000 or the Sermon on the Mount, certainly 500 could be out there. I'm just telling you what the commentaries say. But once again, the reason I'm not trying to put Paul into the Gospels is because the way I set this argument out, I'm only using Paul. So to say, why can't we find this in the Gospels is a red herring to me. I want to talk about Paul. Seven epistles, he said, well, look, there's some epistles 
that almost everybody, at least critical scholars, think Paul didn't write, and he's correct. There's 13 epistles. Hebrews is not one of them, but there's 13 epistles that bear Paul's name. I already said G.A. Wells. Uh, um, the list that most scholars will give you is about seven. G.A. Wells throws Colossians in there. But watch. If there's, if there's epistles that we don't use, guess what? We just won't use them. It's not an issue. Let's talk about the seven or eight authentic epistles. Because if, if, he, if he says, I won't agree with you on the pastorals, the example he used, I'd say, let's set the pastorals aside for tonight. Let's talk about only two, I only use two texts. 1 Corinthians 15 and the break between Galatians 1 to Galatians 2. It's the only one I'm using. I don't care about books that somebody thinks aren't written by Paul. Let's talk about the ones that the agnostic Bart Ehrman New Testament specialist says are the undisputed Pauline epistles. He basically, by undisputed, he means virtually no one disagrees. Let's talk about the positive material, not red herons. The last thing I have here, data and the timeline. Folks, let me remind you, this timeline is not Gary Habermas's. I did not, inv I did not invent this. This came from the 60s and 70s from highly critical scholars. The Garrett Ludemans, Don Crossens, the... Uh, I, I mentioned them, the Bart Ehrmans of the world. This is not a believer's contrived timeline. It's a skeptically contrived timeline, if it's contrived, but what I'm saying is it didn't come from us. So critical scholars do it. I think it's fair if we use data that we share for good reasons. So we now move into a time of uh, uh, open discussion between um, Gary and Ken, and uh, which of you would like, to, would like to begin? Well, if I may make a response. Um, thank you, Gary, uh, for that contribution. I mean, it does open a, a door to many things. You mentioned about, you know, quoting scholars, which you, I know, I know you're, you're, you, 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 you are fond of. Um, a ratio of 30 to 1 in terms of whether they agree more with you than, than, than with the position I'm stating. That's possibly true. I wouldn't doubt that the, the, those who doubt the official story are quite a minority. I mean, does that really surprise anybody? I mean, isn't it easier to believe than to think? You know? Um, he mentions Bart Ehrman, uh, Erdman as, as a, a, uh, a skeptic. What he doesn't mention is, is he actually used to be a born-again Christian evangelical. Why has he changed? Why has he changed? He's, because he studied the manuscripts in great detail over a long period of time. He lost his faith because he studied the data. Now, we're talking here of evidence for a fantastic event. You all are familiar with that, that, that phrase, extraordinary events require extraordinary evidence. Well, I'm not going to push the point that far, but I would say this, that we need pretty good evidence, not flaky evidence, not marginal evidence, not evidence that we can interpret with a favourable Christ Christian gloss. Now, let me make a comparison, if I may, graphically, between the evidence of the resurrection, which appears in the New Testament, there it is, including the, the slight references in Revelations to the, the, to the one who, ca who uh, comes like, uh, with, with a, a, a sword from his mouth. But, you know, the other standard references of the resurrection, they fit quite comfortably on an A4 sheet, rather fewer than 600 words. To give you a comparison of that, something else that has something in the order of 600 words, a McDonald Happy Meal menu. Now, would anybody here be convinced, let's say, of the nutritional value of a McDonald's Happy Meal on the basis of 600 words? Can we be convinced, therefore, that a few pages of the Gospel speak of some extraordinary event? You said I can interrupt you, Ken. Yeah, sure be. Wow. This is great. Okay, Bart Ehrman used to be an evangelical. This is our discussion time, and he, he's a neat guy, he really is. 
Bart Ehrman used to be an evangelical. Ken, we're not going to solve this by going back and forth. By the way, Bart Ehrman has said in his most recent book, it wasn't the manuscripts, it was the problem of evil that bothered him the most. So it wasn't problem it, of evil. It wasn't a... And, and then later, I'm sure he's bothered by the text, but he just said in his latest book, his latest revelation is, it's the problem of evil. But you know what? If you, if you want to start going down the line, I mean, we could say, hey, this guy's converted by studying the evidence, this guy's converted by... And the, and the list is long. As far as extraordinary events require extraordinary evidence, I, I keep saying over and over again, I'm only using text and data as allowed by almost the furthest folks down on that side. I didn't invent this. Here's my point. If they think it's good enough to talk about it, perhaps you'll allow me to use their data and talk about it. I, I don't think that that's, that's weak. I think there's a lot of other data here we could put on the table. I'd be glad to do that. For example, I mean, this is, this would just be, uh, it'd be a wild herring. But if somebody's saying something like, well, how am I supposed to believe in resurrection today? I mean, this is an extraordinary event. I think he started something like this. It started with this kind of an idea. Uh, you know, we're in the fairy tale world. Um, I'll just put something out here, and we can pursue it during the Q&A if you want to. Recent studies of, of near-death experiences, uh, highly evidenced ones. I've been studying this phenomenon for 30 years. This is the only point I'm going to make by bringing this up. If we have evidence for an afterlife, if we do, and I think we do, then all of a sudden the resurrection doesn't look like the most extraordinary thing in the world that takes extraordinary evidence. It looks like a specific case of a phenomena for which we have other data. So I'll just throw that out there. If someone wants extraordinary evidence, let's talk about empirical data from the present. We can do that. But you know, I, I'd love to go back and forth here on some scholars. I'd love to talk about, you know, Bob Price. And, and you do know, right, that Bob's like the only guy in the universe who holds that view. I mean, there are, there's a couple other people, but almost I, nobody. I don't think so. I don't think so. But surely the nature of a debate is to go backwards and forwards. Go ahead. How many, yeah. how many others do you know besides I, Bob? I don't want to discuss scholars. That's, that's, uh, that, that's just cool, you know. It's, it's just what? I don't want to go through a, 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 just quoting names. I'd rather deal with some facts but here. I mean, if you want the to interesting up... thing, Gary, in your exposition is how interestingly you backtrack from your overall view to minimalistic claims then, okay? If we can prove that quite a few of the uh, uh, Pauline epistles are fraudulent, then you're quite happy to dish them. Go, make, make do with the ones you've got left. Well, you know, is this a scientific method? I mean, what sort of method it is? This is the sort of thing that I, I began by saying. Christian apologetics is simply the determination to defend uh, ancient truths at all costs. And it so is. you will bring forward... But atheism is not that. You will bring forward any and every... Humanism is nothing like that, you can to defend an un indefensible position. You know, that, that, that should but Ken, but Ken that's, that's precisely why I've chosen this methodology, not to cite my facts. Dom Crossan, Garrett Ludeman, the Jesus Seminar, are not very well known for being evangelical apologists. In fact, they really hate it. And I'm using their data, and I'm saying, what's the best argument for this? Dom Crossan has just said recently, <laughs> Tom Wright, for those of you who know Bishop Tom Wright, we're going to be together in London just two days. Great guy, 800-page book on the resurrection. He argues the evidence. Guess what? He's debated Dom Crossan three times. I was there all three times. And I heard Dom say this in all three debates. Do you know what? I've been thinking about this material for a whole long, long time, and I think Tom's right on this. What? Now, I want to make it clear. Dom does not believe in the resurrection. But he thinks Tom's argument is right on. So I'm saying... This doesn't sound like a fallacious Christian apologist, believers are out of control. We're using Don Cross's type data and going after it. They're your friends. Gary, surely the point here is if we are rational, we will be led by the evidence. That's we right. We will not put the horse be, be behind the cart and say, this is the truth that we want to establish. We know the truth. It comes to us by faith. Therefore, what facts can we purport to prove this truth? Now, that is not a scientific method. Can, that is, I don't, that I don't is simply apologetics. I don't argue that way. In fact, what you may not know about me is I spent 10 years as a skeptic. And you ready? I used to debate Christians. And I used to tell them they were crazy. And I either became a Buddhist or I was very close to be. I, I don't know why, but I was somewhere else down the religious trail. I came back to this not because I'm exercising faith and I'm just, golly, gee, looking for facts to back up my faith. 
I said, what do I do with this data? And frankly, this is just my personal testimony, it doesn't mean a lot, but I mean, it was the resurrection that jerked me back from this kind of stuff, not, okay, here comes my faith, please let me find some data. It was the other way around. Well, I, 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 you, that is what you say, but I, I, I am losing track of the number of Christian apologists who claim to have been hard-headed atheists. You know, it's, it's now it's, it's par for the course. Well, I have to say, I have never been a Christian. I have always been a hard-headed atheist, and I have never seen anything that would come close to making me think, hey, the resurrection looks like a real event. You know event. what? You need to come over to my house in the States. We'll talk over soccer, <laughs> and we'll be, we'll be working on that. I'll, I'll, I'll happily do that. But I think if we are... To try, if we are attempting to prove a historical truth, we can't begin with the conclusion and say, how can we come out with that result? What's the conclusion? Well, your conclusion is the resurrection is an historical fact, whatever. No, I'm saying if you go back to Do 35, you entertain the possibility then it may not be true? Absolutely. You do? I absolutely. So, okay, well, there, yes, there is hope then. There is hope. Yes, sir. I absolutely maintain it. And I will absolutely give it up hear me? I will absolutely give it up if the data are not there. Well, tell me which of your defences of the resurrection then really convinces you? Never mind all this special pleading which of this, of these... Which of all of them really convinces you? Let's take one practice. Let me give you, for example, you, in many of your books, in fact all of them probably, you make this claim that the disciples suffered unto death for their, for their beliefs. No, I don't say they suffered unto death. I said they were willing to oh, suffer. It's a, okay, no, no, it's, you okay. know, no, you know why the reason why I do that, Ken? Well, it's safer. It's safer because the evidence doesn't support it. That's exactly. Right. Not, the, not the safer one, the evidence one. I don't say that. And just today at Oxford University, I said to the students, don't say that all the disciples died for their faith. We don't have early data for that. And I went through it. The reason I don't say it is not because it's safer. I say it because we don't have data. But the four people who are there in... Um, uh, Jerusalem, we do have first century data for three of the four. Peter, Paul, and James, the brother of Jesus. Only John, we do not have first century. But I don't go around saying we can prove the seven the other disciples. There's about seven of them, Eusebius, I think. I don't cite Eusebius. He's too late. He fails my own rules. Yes, okay. Do you want to quote, quote the epistle of Clement? I'd love to. What do you want to okay. know about it? Well, okay, because that... that... <laughs> Because that is one of your standard defences, that, that they even Peter and Paul died. Am That's I not correct. correct? Yeah? What's wrong with Clement? Yeah. Well, shall we, shall we actually quote the words? Does he actually say Which they, they were martyred? He both said... Uh, yes. No, he does not. Wait no, a he does not. Well, it depends on which... <laughs> here we go. It depends on which... Manu There's two translations of Clement. One is very, very clear. They suffered martyrdom. The weaker of the two... All that it says, the weaker of the two, the, the strong one specifically says they testified to Jesus Christ and went to their graves as martyrs believing, the stronger one. The, the, even the weakest translation says something like this. It says, Paul and Peter went to their reward believing. They died. He says yeah. they died. That's the weaker oh, oh, of the two. Okay. I, I, okay, I mean, I think that's and closer that's, to the words that's I close. have. Okay. Okay. That's Which says nothing. It says nothing. It, they, they, they did their work for Christ, as it would be, and then they died. Maybe for, they were with their Lord in heaven. For no. their faith. No right? evidence for that the, they were ever martyrs. No, I, no, no, okay, here's where we can, we can argue about it all night. But the scholar's interpretation of 1 Corinthians 5, Clement 5, not the 1 Corinthians of Paul, but Clement 5, is that Clement is talking about martyrdom. I'll even say, I'll bet you you'll find that if you go back to the research. But of the stronger statement... It's, it's clearly true. And now okay. James, James okay. the brother of um, Jesus. Um, um, and can we, can we declare what the original meaning of the word martyr was? What do you mean can we declare the... The word martyr actually means witness. Fine. It doesn't mean anyone who suffered and died. Do you know who it started with? Well, I'm sure he will tell us. <laughs> Justin Martyr... Second century. Okay, much went later to, than your, your oh, apostles. Oh, sure, sure, but my point is just to establish the word martyr. Well, it's 50 years later, it's not hugely later. He goes to his death for his testimony as a Christian philosopher and he dies. He dies for that. By the way, the other one is James, and it's reported by Josephus. 
the stoning of James, the fourth Well, we one. can come back to that one, but I'd like to stick with this point about what Christians understand by the idea of persecution and what Christians understand by the idea of martyrdom. Because it's quite clear that early Christians certainly thought any form of treatment that didn't accord with their wishes was some form of persecution that if their family were critical of their Christian faith, they were being persecuted. And their martyrdom was actually to witness to the faith that they had. It had nothing to do with suffering unto death or a willingness to suffer unto death. And we really don't have, as you say, most of the so-called 12 apostles. We could argue about the, 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 the four that we do have. Okay, Paul gives a list of things he suffered. Remember, shipwrecked three times, beaten 40 minus one. Actually... Um, beaten 40 minus 1 three times. He's stoned and left for dead outside. Paul lists these, list, these things he went through, and then tradition tells us he was finally uh, beheaded during the reign of Nero in the early 60s. Uh, no all evidence. Uh, okay, but all I'm saying is, I think that's a fair definition of persecution. Being stoned and left for dead, whipped three times, 40 minus 1, lashes, I think those are fair definitions. I think he's justified in saying it was persecuted. How how would that be so if we're dealing with a religious tract that has no basis in fact? How do we know that those... What's the religious tract? How do we know that what Paul wrote was actually truthful? Who else... Who else validates the claims of Paul? Unlike Jesus Christ, which you can claim is referred to here and there, no, Eight, 18, nobody else refers sources. to Paul. He Jesus, doesn't appear in any secular history at all. He, mentioned, he's, is, he, is, he does appear in one secular source, and he does appear in five Christian sources that can be considered early. Now, if Christians are prejudiced because they mention Paul, then atheists are prejudiced for confirming atheism. I mean, it's not like atheists are automatically valueless and Christians have all kinds of values, both sides have access to grind. Both sides have access to grind. I don't think anyone makes themselves rich by being an atheist. But plenty of people make themselves rich by being Christian. But what does that have to do with who's pre- it, it means who has they have, they have a vested interest in maintaining untruths in a way that an unbeliever does not. But you don't have an axe to grind. You just come at this totally neutrally, and you don't have any belief. You bring nothing to the data. Ken, I'm not, I'm not being no. nasty, but a cure for that is a course in philosophy. <laughs> I, like anybody else, including yourself, Gary, ha- ha- have subjective views on things. You sure do, and so do I. But, but what is the more extraordinary claim, then? That, that God exists and raises people from the dead, or in the absence of any evidence to that effect, that it is not true. Well, Ken, it's certainly not in the absence of evidence, but, but you say, which is more extraordinary? See, your comment betrays the same kind of angle, the, the prejudice that we all have. It, it betrays the same thing. When you say, what in the world could make you believe in God or resurrection or afterlife or something like that? That's a complicated thesis that we're unwarranted in conceding only from a naturalistic viewpoint. If God exists, if, okay, and if there's an afterlife and if there's a resurrection, if, it's all of a sudden not just, it's just not uncomplicated, it's the answer for the universe. What I mean is for you to say, for you to say, that's an extraordinary thesis and incredible to believe, because if you're an atheist, of course it is. That shows that kind of angle that I'm saying philosophy will kind of knock out of you if you take a philosophy class. It, it tells us we all have an axe to grind, and, we, and, and your view from my angle is incredible, and my view from your angle is incredible. That both shows we have an angle. I don't believe the rejection of the extraordinary and the fantastic and the fabulous in the absence of clear proof is an axe to grind. That and, should be the position that we all adopt. We should not believe the extraordinary unless it can be disproved. I mean, that would be lunacy. Why don't we believe in, in, in uh, Jack and the Beanstalk? Or, or, or Snow White. Or, or any, any such story. We're back at the beginning of your paper, or your speech, which was, took some notes here, it's sad that religion is still with us today. Ken, the reason we're still talking about religion in the city of David Hume is because, listen, if there were no data, 
and a bunch of fanatics from both sides, because we're all, you know, everyone's got an extra grind, running around giving both sides, it wouldn't have survived. The reason we're still talking about it, and there's a Tom Wright who's taught at both Oxford and Cambridge, that there's a Jimmy Dunn at Durham, that there's a Larry Hurtado right here at Edinburgh. The reason these folks are around, that a, uh, a Richard, you know, Richard Burridge at London, Richard Balkum just retires from, the reason that goes on in academia, guess what? I think they would be drummed out of court if there weren't some data to talk about. It wouldn't be around. Because listen, if these guys are doing this kind of stuff, folks, let me tell you about my belief. I believe in Christianity. Now let's all try this semester to find some facts to back up our faith. I don't think they'd be full professors. I don't think they'd be around at I, I, I feel very, I, I feel too strongly about the British universities to say, those guys hold important chairs for reasons. Now quoting the names isn't gonna help us, but the names show data. The names show reasons to believe. And I think the reason they hold these chairs, Larry Hurtado, I understand, is the head of the department here at Edinburgh. Uh, the reason they're still alive is because there's still data to talk about, like this right here. What you are not acknowledging in that statement, Gary, is that the church is an institution of society that dominated Europe for 1,500 years. We have only escaped its clutches in the last 200. You know, of course there is a religious establishment and it, it has its, 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 its centres of power and authority. It has all the, 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 the gloss of being part of the establishment. Of course it, it regards any rational critique as equally as fanatical as itself. So the church runs Oxford and Cambridge No, it doesn't, and but it's his, it's his, if the origins of those universities are very much... But I mean, if, the, the, if the Pope or uh, uh, Rowan, you know, uh, Rowan Williams is going to say something like, this is what we believe in this country. I think you ought to have chairs at Durham and Edinburgh, and that's not going to put... Oxford doesn't listen to the church. Yeah, but you're putting history backwards. You're putting history backwards. Where was, were those centers of authority before the modern era? They were in the hands of the church. That's fine. But this is 2008, and this is a secular university system in your country, in my country. These are secular university systems. Well, you have West. more than a secular university That's system. That's fine. Okay, yeah. fine. Ken, in a secular university system, I'll ask the same question you asked when you started your paper. Why are we still talking about this in a secular university system with major chairs at Oxford, Cambridge, and Edinburgh? Why? It's not because there's nothing to talk about, or we wouldn't be talking about them. <laughs> As you wish, as you wish. There's more to be said there, um, but we'll turn now to some Q&A. And uh, if you'd like to raise your hands, the stewards with the roving mics will come to you. Okay, seeing quite a few questions around. Uh, gentleman uh, in the middle there. Yep, yep, that's you. Okay, try and get the... No, sorry, behind you there. Yes, yourself, that's it. Okay. I didn't hear your last question. So you have to, you have to, before you join this university, you have to sign to a court which says you believe in the Bible, the Bible is true. Is that not the case? I do. Well, anyone who wants to study it doesn't do that. No, that's not true. That's not true. Okay. No. You well, you can be an atheist and be accepted at Liberty University. Really? Yes, sir. Okay. Ken can go to Liberty. In fact, I hope he does. <laughs> No, I understand. Repeat the question. If you wanted to sure. evidence and data to back up your assumption, sure. are you not starting over with something good, good question. And, and I appreciate his attitude. In case you didn't hear, he said, I'm not you know, picking on you and so on. I've been asked to repeat the question. I'm probably not going to do a great job with repeating it, but it goes something like this. 
You talk about the secular university system, that's because I'm in this country and I was talking about guys who teach at those major schools I mentioned, but he said, what about your university? It's a religious school. Uh, don't people, don't Christians have to, don't students have to be Christians to sign a statement of faith to go there and no drinking and no this and no this and no this. Um, no, you could be an atheist and, and come to Liberty University. Now, is it a Christian university? Yes, it is. But listen, I make no qualms about being an evangelical Christian. I do not hide that. It's everything I write. Nobody who knows me thinks I'm trying to hide that or trying to pretend like liberties like Oxford. Nothing like that. I'm just saying that here's, here's my whole point. The guys I'm quoting are from Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Oxford, Cambridge. Would I still be there? No, you're right, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't go there and hold that. But that's not my point. My point, here, here's my whole question. Using the fellows that I started tonight from these major British universities and many, many other schools, here's my question. Can I as a Christian, okay, if you say, well listen, tell me the truth, what do you think about the Bible? You're asking, and if you ask me this, I'll say, hey listen, I think the Bible's the word of God. I think it's a trustworthy book. I would tell you that, but, I'm, but that's not the way I started. Tonight, I want, to use, I want to ask, are there enough pieces of data from well-known scholars that I don't have to do this from my viewpoint? I will not come here and say, I believe the Bible's inspired. Let's start with that and see if there's a resurrection. Wow, there's a resurrection. Okay, I'm going to believe. No, I'm saying, can we start with people like, I won't repeat them again, but these major universities around us here, can we start with their presuppositions and get there? And I'm saying yes. It's really irrelevant where I teach or what I believe. I'll just concede for you, I'm an evangelical Christian. I'm okay with that. But here's what I'm asking. Could you still get there on non-evangelical presuppositions? That's my question. Josh, can, can, I, can I make a contribution here? Because we've heard the question, I hope, and we've heard Gary's response. Let me quote from Liberty University's own website. And it reads as follows. Faculty join Liberty only after completing a rig rigorous interview process that confirms a born again relationship with Christ, a clear understanding of the purpose and aims of Liberty. Now, to me, that doesn't sound as if that would take on board an atheist. That would... No, 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 I'm, talk I'm talking about a student. A student. He, he okay. said, I, think, okay. I thought he said, could you go there? And you let's, definitely can be an atheist. Let's move on to the next question. Okay. Uh, yes, um, you uh, said that, that uh, the, the, the story that you told would um, uh, supply sufficient evidence for um, uh, a non-evangelical to consider that that story is correct. Well, on the basis that that statement is made, then is it not the case that Joseph Smith, who we certainly know existed, and had eyewitness testimony of the angel Moroni, <laughs> um, uh, his, his uh, testimony, which is much more recent and, and followed by you know, millions of Americans as well or whatever else, who are often very intelligent people, why, why should we believe uh, uh, um, a, a possibly conjectural figure from 2,000 years ago and not believe Joseph Smith or... Um, uh, um, the Prophet Muhammad, or actually, for that matter, uh, one of perhaps um, 20 million Americans who have been abducted by aliens. Uh, I mean, uh, particularly uh, given the fact that the Gospels do not agree with each other in almost any major respect as far as, uh, you know, when or even where or by whom or by how many people uh, this individual was seen. I mean, the, Matthew 27, 53 tells us that the graves opened after an earthquake. Uh, as Jesus died. And three days later, uh, you know, dozens or a large quantity of the Jewish saints were resurrected as well, walked up into the city of Jerusalem and were seen by many people. Now, you know, if we, if we throw that out, 
uh, as evidence. It's funny how we never hear Christians talking about that. Um, you would have thought that that would be a spectacular piece of evidence for the, for the divinity of Christ. Um, but, you know, that is very, very much under the carpet. If we throw that out, what, what on earth warrant could we have to suppose that, let's say he did exist, right? This, this, this guy... Uh, Thank you. I think we've got the okay, gist of well, the question. Well, fine. Okay. <laughs> So, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear it. How did he even recognize it was Jesus? He'd never well, met him before. Repeat it, that I won't have to repeat. The first part of the question was about the existence of the Mormon church. Why should um, uh, um, this audience believe you, Gary, over uh, Joseph Smith and his account, of, um, his account of faith? And the second part of the question was about Matthew 27, 53, and uh, to do with the, um, the breaking of the tombs. I understand it in Matthew 27. Why, why, why don't Christians use that evidence more? Why don't we use it more? Mm. Okay. Two questions. Mormonism, Matthew 27. Folks, it's not my job tonight. I'm not trying to go after any other belief system. I'm not trying to be, say, you know, you're a loser for this or that. That's not my job. But if I were to investigate the Mormon claim and say, isn't this the same sort of claim? You have eyewitnesses, they were early, I suppose that's, I guess that's where you're going. They're early eyewitnesses and so on. One major problem with this is that there are witnesses who were supposed to have seen the plates and so on and so on, and virtually every single one of them whose name is not Smith left or got kicked out of the church. Now, if you, if you tried to import that into the New Testament, you'd say, well, we have these 12 guys, but Peter got kicked out for this, so-and-so walked out. What I'm saying is, it's a different situation. I'm just saying it's not analogous, okay? It's not analogous on the grounds of data. As far as Matthew 27, I have a really easy response, and it goes like this. I'm not trying to defend everything in the Bible tonight. I want to talk about this, and if you said to me, I don't like, I'm not saying you're saying this, but if you said, I don't like Matthew 27, and I said, Man, that's part of it. And you go, well, I, I don't like it. And you go, fine. But I'm discussing this. We could, you could, I, I, let, let's just make it this way. I could say to you, you're right. You're right. Have it your way on Matthew 27. Okay. I mean, I, it's not the resurrection of Jesus. So I could say, hey, I'm here to discuss the resurrection. What do you do about this? See, again, let me repeat this. My methodology is to accept what critical scholars accept and to talk about that. They don't like Matthew 7, 53 and following. You're right. So I don't bring it up because it's not one of the datum they want to speak about. So I'm not free to speak about it because I will only, in other words, my methodology avoids the whole thing unless, unless critical scholars concede it. They don't concede that. You're correct. So I won't use it. I don't talk about it because I'm in their genre. I'm in their timeline. This is developed by them, not by conservatives. Well, yeah, I'll only make a small point because I think the point is well made. If the, the, the basis of, of, of Gary's claims for the resurrection of a true Christianity, or that particular, the mainstream Christianity, it should surely be true uh, of the Mormon church. I mean, in, in a sense, we have no doubt that the Smith family existed. There's no ambiguity there. So, yeah, it, it, why believe one or the other? Well, of course, really, in our heart of hearts, we know they're both fraudulent. Um, and uh, of course, the, the, the opening of the tombs, and, the, and you know, G Gary's methodology has to be admired. It's pick a mix, whatever will fit. You know, if that one wasn't, won't work, let's get the next one. Uh, you know, it's an it's, it's admirable uh, approach. You know, it, it's sort of like any contingency will do. Doesn't convince me. Let's go on to the next question, please. Okay, let's have um, let's have uh, this lady at the front here, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, well, of course, we're talking about everything because it's so obscure. The Bible is so obscure. But we're really going on about source criticism tonight. And I wanted to ask you really about what's Paul's angle and put it to you like this. Say you have a Jewish group who have created a religion, their own God, and it's one God, and it's only one God. Don't you need then to do something about the rest of the world? How are you going to bring them into the story? And wouldn't you need to create an alternate uh, angle for them 
to pursue, like the Noahide? Wouldn't you need to create something? Wouldn't Paul actually have needed to create a new religion? The sidekick for Judaism would be Christianity. Wouldn't Saul have been dubious? Wouldn't he have a vested interest in creating something to bring us all into the belief in this one God, a Jewish God? Isn't there some uh, angle there that he has that we need to think of if we're really looking at source criticism? Okay, I'm using, this whole thesis assumes source criticism, so I'm using source criticism in that source criticism is a generic title under which there are several kinds of criticism, and that's the sort I'm using here. As far as why would Paul, why wouldn't Paul want to do something like this, from every source we know, whether it's Acts or Paul's own epistles, these, these genuine epistles, Philippians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I persecuted the church when he was Saul. Let's put it this way, there's not a speck of evidence that implies or says or indicates, not a speck of first century data that says that Paul was tired, wanted to give up, wanted to switch sides, wanted to universalize Judaism. I think that would be a very foreign set of ideas to, to New Testament scholarship, I mean critical New Testament scholarship. I don't see Paul wanting to do anything. He wanted to wipe the sect out. He said, I thought I was doing God a favor by taking men, women, and children and imprisoning or killing them. We accept Acts as historical. He sits at the feet of the man, Stephen, while he's stoned. I don't see any evidence to believe that Paul wants to start a religion. Now, see, here's one of the things I would say. Why do we need to give a bunch of evidences for this, but we can have a theory like maybe Paul went off the deep end, or maybe Paul wanted to spread a universal religion, but no evidence for it. There's no evidence that Paul wanted to move in a different direction. But sometimes we feel that if we give the opposite side, we can speak without evidence. Sometimes we can just postulate. My other reason for that, number one, no evidence. Paul says he did the opposite. Second, on this timeline, that was one of the main things I was referring to. This wasn't Paul's idea. Paul got it from somebody else. Paul gets it from Peter, James, John. Now, now Paul also saw Jesus, if you believe the New Testament accounts. But what I'm saying is, the whole point of this was, it wasn't Paul's idea. And then when I, when I mentioned Hurtado and Jimmy Dunn and uh, Richard Baucom taking it back to 30 AD, Paul wasn't a believer. I mean, that's when he was fighting against the church. So in other words, the people who were around who were teaching the deity of Christ and the resurrection before Paul, that would show you it's not Paul's idea. If it predates Paul, it's not Paul. So I would say two large arguments are number one, you have to answer this data and why people have it before Paul. And my first point was, we don't have one bit of data that says that Paul was this or that and decided to start a new religion. I don't think we're justified in starting something new, uh, starting a thesis without data. Yeah, yeah, if, yeah to, to just co uh, co contribute there, um, Certainly some scholars do maintain that, that Paul is the true author of Christianity. My own comment would be that we shouldn't look for a simplistic explanation for the phenomenon of, of Christianity. The Christian world today is a house divided. We all know that in many, many sects. It was no different in the early days. Christianity has always been divided. And certainly in, the, in, in that crucial period of the first couple of centuries, it was, there were a multitude of, of different creeds, different Christianities, and the Pauline trend was just one of them, and, and that's, a, that's a fact that we should realise, that the Gospels as we know them are the result of a struggle between those groups over a couple of hundred years. Let's turn to the uh, next question, please. And yes, this gentleman down at the front, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for uh, Mr. Humphreys, primarily, and it's just a question of motive, really. Um, I was wondering why, uh, what it is about the person of Jesus um, that you think persuaded so many thousands of Jews who had clung to their beliefs religiously, if you excuse the pun, um, for several centuries um, in the face of considerable persecution from most of the empire's gang. What was it about the person of Jesus that... Uh, 
provoke them to throw in or at least substantially modify many of these beliefs or to, uh, to put it another way, um, what was it particularly about uh, the early believers that made them so incredibly persuasive um, that they could, well, really alter a religion that had uh, showed remarkable resilience um, in not being possible to alter it for so many centuries? Yeah, yeah. a good question, a good question. And it, it, it's, uh, it, it's one of the, the pillars of, of, of the, uh, the historical Jesus school, that there was this mass conversion and the church grew in some explosive fashion. The problem is, outside of Christian references, that, that, is, a, that is a position that one cannot maintain. The, the interesting thing about early Christianity is its invisibility. It wasn't so apparent. Now, we have the alternative, we have the option of believing the Big Bang origin. In other words, the birth of a Messiah uh, from a virgin and, and, and the crucifixion and the resurrection. Sure, that would be one explanation if you want to. But another explanation, which I think is more convincing, is that Christianity emerged from Judaism as a result of the suffering of the Jewish people. They had waged and lost two major wars with Rome, and that was a crisis for their religion. And that, I think, was the impetus for, for the, the, the emergence of the various Christian sects. And it fits the, the evidence more closely, because you cannot, no matter how many claims are made, I know there, is re, there are references in, in the book of Acts for, you know, 3,000 uh, converts, it claims, after, after the episode of, of speaking in tongues. You know, but, you know, do we really believe that happened? There is no historical residue of any mass conversion to the Jews uh, uh, until a, a century or so later. So, you know, I don't accept that, that, you know, that something miraculous came along and, and converted Jews from, from a faith. It was the suffering in the wars against Rome that led to their religion breaking into more than one element. Real quickly, two recent Jewish scholars, non-Christian, no Christian acts to grind. Pincus Lapid, 1982, The Resurrection of Jesus, A Jewish Perspective, and very, very recently, just appeared off the press, Gaze of Ramesh, professor of Jewish history, professor emeritus, Oxford University. Two Jews, not Christian, both examined the data. Conclusion, Jesus was raised from the dead. No acts to grind. I think that's interesting. Nobody he says, nobody outside of the book of Acts recorded the explosion of early Christianity. Let me give you some names. Josephus, Tacitus, Suetonius, three Roman historians. If you call Count Josephus as a Roman historian, Count as a Jewish historian, whatever you want. All three of them. Tacitus says, after this pernicious doctrine was destroyed, he said, when Pilate killed Jesus, he says the thing broke out again and spread around. It came all the way around the empire to Rome. So does Suetonius. Josephus talks about this. I'm just saying we have this recorded from other people. And one comment about the four Gospels came out of a struggle of centuries. Folks, listen. The four at the, as the first century closed, there were only four Gospels in existence. It's not my fault if the early church took the only four books there were at that time. They just happened to be the Gospels. It wasn't like there were ten others and they ignored them. They were the only four that were around in 100 AD. Gary, can I make a quick response to that? It, 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 as you well know, you, re, you, you, you mentioned the name uh, Josephus there uh, as a Jewish historian, and of course he's a very important source. And everybody knows that the single paragraph in the antiquity, in Antiquities of the Jews is at the minimum been tampered with and in all probability is fake. And whatever else you might quote as, as a source, we are indebted to the Christian scribes for copies of them. You said probability is what? That it's what? The quote in Josephus? The, 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 the paragraph that refers to, to the, 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 the tribe of Christians is fake. The whole paragraph? Well, you see, that, that's the point. Yes, we can, we can, scholars do, I know, argue, well, a bit of this testimony has been fake, but not all of it. But, I mean, that's a, a pretty almost, weak argument. Almost, now, listen, one guy in the world could hold something and be right. I'll admit that. But the almost total position in the world is there are phrases in there which are questionable, but the statement itself, the base statement, is correct. That testimony comes from James Charlesworth, Princeton University, not Liberty University's religion department. 
This comes from Princeton University. He's tallying up, this is his area, he tallies, he tallies it up. Majority of scholars, John Drain, another British scholar, Sterling University, says the same thing. So, sure, we can debate that. By the way, the three, the three names I mentioned, Josephus has the least to say about this. Tacitus and Suetonius say more. Suetonius said it spread all the way around the Mediterranean and we failed to stamp it out when it came to Rome. That's a huge explosion of belief. Let's move on to our next question, please. And there's a gentleman, I think, at the back in the green. Yep. Um, first, I want to thank you both for your very vivid uh, and interesting discussions. Um, like you said, Gary, there are an incredible amount of presuppositions that you both bring. And one of yours seems to be that, that good historiography means a watertight argument. And Ken, yours seems to be something along the lines that there's this Kantian-esque rational man that needs defending from some big bad wolf um, or something. But what, what my question really is, is um, just to take it away slightly from where you've been, is so what? I mean, if, if I was to believe either, either of your arguments, What's that got to do with anything? And we can see with the plurality of questions, there's an awful lot of claims to be said even on one issue. What is it about your arguments that means anything anyway? I mean, what, what is this rational man, Ken, and what's he meant to look like? And Gary, so what if your historiography is correct? What's that got to do with anything? I did not hear it. No. Okay, so the question was, um, if we take uh, Ken's uh, rational man, and if we take uh, Gary's account of the uh, resurrection of Jesus on, histo on, on um, historical grounds, what has that got to say to us today? I think that's the gist of the question. Yeah? Okay. What does it have to say today? What does it mean and for... did you ask both of us to respond? Yes, yes he did. Go ahead, Ken. Well... <laughs> <laughs> What would you say? That's if, if I understand the question correctly, it, 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 which uh, and I did have difficulty hearing it, um, I'd say rational man has, has given us the modern world. Rational man makes it possible to us to be here a, 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 and speak these words tonight. Christianity had its best shot for 15 centuries, and what did it give us? What did it give us? Wars, suffering, inhumanity. You know, sorry. <laughs> that's God. <laughs> that's that stop. Well, I doubt it. No, no, it hasn't. But you know, the progress that humanity has made is thanks to rational man. Irrational man gave us nothing. And here, all I was—I was ready to say something nice about preaching and whatnot. Um, I have to say something. Take all the Christian atrocities you want to and dump them together, and I'm going to admit. Christians fail. Christians can be jerks. Christians can ignore Jesus, and they should have followed him. They didn't. And if they were more ethical, they would have done this and that. I admit that. But I will say this, and that I just saw the statistic the other day. Over 120 million deaths in the 20th century alone by atheistic regimes. Over 120. That doesn't solve anything. I'm just saying you can't say... Because Christians do these dastardly things, hey, let's look over the fence. Let's say what's going on over here. Okay, but the question itself, a great question. I would, I would love to chat about, I mean, I'd like to spend the rest of my career talking about so what. I'd like to spend the rest of my career saying, what's the resurrection mean? I'm down here in this end of things because you can see tonight there's a lot of healthy questioning about it, and this is where I do my work. I think the resurrection speaks about a lot of things today. Let me just say one thing. In First Thessalonians, Paul, one of those authentic, epistles. Paul says Christians grieve when they lose a loved one. He says they grieve, but not as those without hope. If the resurrection occurred. If. And that says something about an afterlife. If that or anything says something about an afterlife. I think grieving with hope is a tremendous difference and in, in progress over grieving without hope. Now, Ken, I'm sure, is going to say, well, doesn't this, doesn't this all depend on whether the resurrection occurred or not? And if, if that's where he would go, that's what I would say if I were down there, and that's correct. But I think there's some good reasons for it, and, and so I would say, yeah, I think at the end of the day, it makes... Paul says, for example, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, he, we don't have any ethics. Christians don't... You cannot base an objective ethical system on atheism. Do you we can want, have an ethical system, but you can't have an ethical system. Do we want to live system. with illusions just because they, they make us feel good? Well, right, but here's what we're debating tonight. Is it an illusion? 
That's and again, all, that is why what, do we that is still what we're debating. This in our universities, but. Let's have uh, one final question, please, um, and we will have. Um, let's have the the gentleman at the back there. There we go. Yes, uh, in the in, in the blue top. Yep, yeah, that's you. Yep. Thank you both very much. Uh, it's been very very interesting, Professor. I uh, just, I really felt the need to pick up on something you said just there. Um, I was going to ask a different question, but uh, now you've given me what I think is a more interesting one to ask. I mean, um, you just said 120 million people were killed in atheist regimes uh, in the 20th century. You've used the word atheist there, but I think what you mean is communist. Now, communism is only one atheist doctrine. It's not even the most popular one. In fact, my understanding is that there was significant collaboration by religious believers with communist regimes. And communism, to me, is no more rational. And I think what Kenneth has been defending tonight is rationalism above all. Communism, to me, is no more rational than any form of theism. I just wondered if you had any comment on that. I, I fell in here. I'm sorry. The question was, uh, communism is no more rational than any form of theism, and that um, essentially that communism wasn't necessarily an atheistic belief. It was actually supported by Christians, according to the questioner. It was what? Supported by Christians or those of some, of, those uh, holding some sort of Christian conviction. Okay, and what are you asking me? This <laughs> is an argument that is used very regularly um, as soon as the atrocities of religions are raised by the secular and what I would call the rational side, religious believers naturally fire backwards, but communism dot, dot, dot. And I say, absolutely, communism by me was atrocious. Um, I've never agreed with it. I've disagreed with communism for longer than I've disagreed with religion. Thank you. Okay. Uh, he said uh, that uh, essentially that... Um that communism, um, as you've painted it, 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 that's not a correct picture of communism. It's uh, not? It's not a correct picture of communism, I think. Well, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't have a lot to say. I think what you'd do is you'd, we'd have to sit down. I'm not a scholar in this area, but I think you'd have to put the different claims of the different regimes. All of them, as I understand them, are not communists. But that, that's, you know, I think you have to sit them down here and say, okay, if we want to evaluate this, we're going to say, Here's the atrocities Christians committed, how many numbers. Here's non-Christian. I think you're just going to have to sit down and count. I don't have any idea how you're going to get Christians and communism together, um, at least not as, as, I mean, Christians are the ones that go to jail under this system. So I, I have a hard problem. I don't know. I don't know how we're going to solve this. But I think yeah. we just sit down and talk about stats. I, all I was doing was saying, if we say, if we make a response to Christians who, we should say atheists who. And listen, listen I'm willing to concede the following. All of us, none, or let's put it this way, none of us lives up to his or her philosophy. We all fail. I'm just saying there's, there's name calling and you know, rock throwing on both sides of the fence. That's basically where I was going. And Christians admit this, by the way, it's called sin. And, and, you know, and, and Christians just say, you got us, we failed. I mean, if that's your point, fine. But I think we could sit down and talk about how much chaos, I think that would be another interesting question. Outside of that, I don't have much response. We'll, uh, we'll close off the Q&A there, and we'll just uh, come to some closing statements. Um, first from uh, Gary, a few minutes, and then Ken, a few minutes. Uh, some brief closing statements, please. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'll stand up again. I don't know if I'm supposed to. <laughs> Folks, listen. I've already admitted from one of the questions earlier, I am a Christian. I make no qualms about it. I have many publications that say that. That's not my point. My point is this. Can I start with historical presuppositions by those who do not hold my view? Those who would not hold anything close to a conservative Christian view of any sort. And can I use their data? And this entire argument I gave and the other points I made, undisputed Pauline epistles, points like that, do not come from my mindset, do not come from my position on the fence. In fact, this argument was not developed by conservatives at all. My point is that if we were to start with other non-Christian presuppositions, I think we have a basis 
to say that Jesus was raised from the dead. And my chief argument said, we can get back to 30 AD, we can talk about early eyewitness testimony. And, and I, you know, other things came up in the discussion, the give and take, and I started saying, I guess I went all around full circle to Ken's opening comment. And I said, no, I, it's not good that Christianity didn't die out. The very fact that it's alive and well at Edinburgh University, look at the group tonight. The very fact, now some of us want to stomp it out and some of us want to raise the flag, but the very fact that there are this many people tonight tells me it's a pretty exciting issue. I'll bet you don't all leave. I'll bet you we sit around and talk afterwards. It's a hot idea. And the fact that the head of the religion department here thinks good evidence. And all these other universities, you can get, a, you can get away with it at Oxford and Cambridge. All I'm saying is, starting with these sorts of presuppositions, not mine, somebody else's, we can build a case for the early eyewitness testimony for the resurrection. Now, I think what comes out of this, and, and whenever the gospel is defined in the early church, is always the deity, death, resurrection of Jesus. My point was that all started from 30 AD, and the call of the New Testament is to exercise faith. Christians fail. Christians can be jerks. Christians can try to make money out of their preaching, and they shouldn't do it. I'm just saying there is a a better form of Christianity that we all fail as Christians, if you take that name, we all fail to live up to it, but we still hold Jesus Christ up there. And I still have, I hope, a high view of each one of you. Ken and I, I hope, are going to be friends after this is over. I know from my viewpoint, hey, this is, he, he's fun. And I really do wish he lived next door to me. That's what discussion is about. That's what's fun about this. And the fact that it's still alive and well tonight it's because there's something to say besides, if all I said was, I've got faith. Any questions? If that's all I said tonight, you'd all have rushed out the door and say, what a lousy evening. It's because there's some data we can debate. I think that's exciting. I think that's an exciting basis to talk about, and I'll just say in closing, something exciting to there are implications for our life. There are implications in ethics. There are implications for end of life, for suffering, as I said a moment ago. I think it's important, but it's not outdated. Okay. I think in the resurrection, which is the subject of this debate, we are dealing with a, a fairy tale. It probably doesn't matter that many people believe strange and silly notions, but unfortunately, when it comes to religious ideas, we can't be quite as comfortable with that. There is a part of this planet called the Holy Land. It is perhaps the most violent and dangerous uh, place on the planet. I think the dangers of irrational belief always lurk. And after all, if, if its claim is that believing in a few questionable ideas gives you hope, then let's also remember Christianity at its heart has decided that we are all sinners that you know, are unworthy of God's divine purpose. You know, it has a very pessimistic view. It, it, it applauds how servile uh, behaviour in front of this supposed God. It, 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 it asks us to, to, to uh, uh, de de denigrate ourselves in order to be humble enough to, to be worthy of him. So I think religion has, and Christianity in particular, has some worrying aspects. And if... That danger that lurks in a particular form of evangelical Christianity uh, ever got its way, we would very rapidly move back to a, a, a novel version of the Dark Age. You know, welfare and, 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 and uh, the so social programs would be handled by the church. Uh, biblical law would replace civil law. I mean, there are tremendous dangers there. So, although it would be nice if whether there was erection could be maintained as simply an academic belief, uh, academic discussion that Gary and I could could have a, a fireside chats about. There is a very real danger there, and that's why we have to take a more positive stance in resisting these silly notions. Thank you.
Well, thank you to both uh, Gary and Ken. We need to say a few words of thanks now to, to various people. I'd like to invite uh, Hannah Kelly, who's the president of the Christian Union, to come and say uh, a few words of thanks to various people. Thank you, Josh. Um, on behalf of the Christian Union of Edinburgh University, I would like to extend a heartfelt thanks to the Philosophy Society uh, for working with us in facilitating this discussion. It's really good to be able to consider and think together about these issues. So thank you, Georgie, and thank you to the Philosophy Society for working together with this, and we look forward to conversing more in the future. Clearly, an event of this size would not be possible without the help of our lovely stewards and door staff, so I'd like to thank them um, for all their help in uh, ensuring our safety this evening. I'd also like to thank Harrison Gilmore and his publicity team for advertising and promoting this event, and all those involved in flyering during the week. Having said all this, it's fairly clear that an event of um, this size would not be possible without the um, initiative and work and commitment of one truly remarkable individual. And as such, I'd love to extend our huge appreciation to Josh Horden here um, for all your work and planning that you've put into this event. Josh, you've just been fantastic to work with and your dedication to public discussion is really inspirational. So I'd just love for us to extend our appreciation to Josh. Um, and finally, if anybody here would like to explore more the significance um, of the claims that Christianity makes about the resurrection, then um, we would love to talk with you some more. Um, on the bookstall, which is just out of the door on your right, there will be some sign-up sheets. And if you would um, like to jot down your email address, then we'll endeavor to put you in touch with a member of the Christian Union who would um, meet up with you for coffee or whatever and chat through any questions that you might have. But thank you once again for coming, and thank you to Josh. Okay, well, thank you for that, Hannah. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank Josh as well, because he's been a star. All the hard work he's put into bringing the event together. Um, I'd like to thank the Christian Union and the Philosophy Society for all of their efforts. Um, it's a really great opportunity to bring these societies together um, for free thinking discussion and open forum. It's really important in society. So um, thanks for all that effort. And uh, if you've got any philosophical qualms, then do get in touch with the Philosophy Society, because... Um, we do a lot of this kind of thing. Um, and again, I'd like to thank the speakers, um, Ken and Gary. Really coming to the end now, and then we can all go for a drink. Um, we want to say a big thank you to uh, Stephen Carter and his uh, AV team who have given their time voluntarily and expertly. This has been a remarkable effort from you, so thank you very much. Thanks too to the staff at the University of Edinburgh for their assistance in arranging, arranging the event, to the National Secular Society for their support of the evening, and to a number of churches in Edinburgh who have um, who've supported and especially want to thank uh, Alistair Noble. I want to thank to the UCCF, the University and Colleges Christian Fellowship, which is the Christian Union movement in this country, uh, for bringing Gary to the UK, especially thanking Peter Luce and Peter May. I just want to say a few final words uh, to follow on from what Georgie and Hannah have already said. We hope that this event and others like it will stimulate ongoing dialogue between agnostics, atheists, people of Christian faith and people of other faiths. It's very important in these times that we do take the big questions of life seriously, such as the claims of Christian faith. And it's especially so in a major university city and centre of cultural influence like Edinburgh, sometimes known as the Athens of the North. We very much hope that there'll be similar opportunities to, to carry on exploring these matters this evening, in the coming days and in similar events to come. So as you, as you leave, please do take the opportunity to look at the, the bookstall. There's DVDs, books, information about Phil Sock and the Christian Union. And there's also be, also be a collection at the door to help defray the costs of the evening. Not cheap to, to arrange an, an event like this. We're very grateful for your one pound. If you'd like to contribute anything more um, to help defray the costs, we'd be extremely grateful.
there'll just be so, there'll be some bowls at the door. Just chuck a few quid in there or whatever you can spare uh, to help us along. Um, and lastly, we do need to empty the building in the next 20 minutes. So please do, please do stay around and chat, as Gary suggested. Uh, and please do carry on these discussions. Hang on a moment. Thank you again very much to uh, Gary Habermas and Ken Humphreys. And thank you for coming. Good night. Thank you.